completely resolved to it. I know a couple of times in my life I've had a few of those decisions. Um, deciding where I was going to go to school, deciding to go to seminary, um, deciding when we were going to get married. Where, as I'm, I'm processing the decision and everything like that, my mind is just in anguish. Thinking, what if I do this? What if I do that? Uh, you know, what about this? I'm trying to put all these pieces together and hold all these plates up in the air. And when I finally come to the, come to the decision, when I finally say, yes, I'm going to seminary. Yes, I am you know, making another attempt at the military. All of a sudden, all that anguish goes away. And it's like you're beyond the making the decision and you can finally be at peace with it. That's kind of what Jesus is probably going through at this point. Even though he knows what's coming, he is so resolved at it that he can be at peace at it, knowing that work is basically complete. And he is about to accomplish that one true purpose that he came for. Glorifying the Father. So he asked to be restored to the glory that he has been given to him, or that he had given up, I'm sorry, when he came, when he took on human form, when the Christmas event happens. After he had emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being born into human likeness. People write volumes about trying to explain what exactly did Christ give up or empty himself of. That could probably be 400 pages all by itself. What? I'm not going to try and explain. I can't say I know, I know definitively myself. But he's asking, put me back to that. Allow me to be in your presence the same way I was before I emptied myself. The time is coming for his prayer, for this prayer to be fulfilled, as he's been prepping the disciples for this. Saying constantly, I'll be with you for just a little while longer. Don't you know, I'm not going to be with you much more. <coughs> and now comes the part he wants them to overhear. As he starts praying for his disciples, starting off in verse 13. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy complete among themselves. Or in themselves, depending on which translation you're reading. While they are losing their teacher in a physical sense, his prayer is that they would experience joy. A joy not just fleeting, but a joy made complete in this, this time of darkness that God would bring light to them. More on this later. Hang on to that for a He prays this in front of them, recognizing the world probably hates them right now. Just as the world hated him. After the burial, the burial, what do the disciples do? They run up in the upper room and lock the door for fear that the Jews are going to come after them. They realize these people who crucify Jesus, who mob Jesus, the second they get associated with them, they're going to hate. They're going to, the mobs are going to hate them too. Are going to persecute them. Why? Well, they don't claim their values. They don't seek their treasures. They don't run their rat, rat, rat race. Some of these may be modern day examples. Yes, I'm sure they did. Uh, John had written about the rat race of trying to get the most amount of camels that you could in your stable. Maybe something like that did exist. I don't know. But here's the point. Jesus says, you do not belong to the world. Neither do I. Neither did I as I minister. It's not just we got what Jesus got. But he got what we get. 
the hatred, the persecution that Christians go through for defending their faith, for claiming their faith, he knows about it. It's so important, he says it twice in this prayer, verses 14 and 16. And he prays that they not be taken out of the world, not be saved from this persecution that they're going through. That we not be taken out or yanked from the troubles that we go through for being Christians. Well, that stinks. I'm sure when Paul was up in the third heaven in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, he probably didn't want to come back. Didn't he experience God's glory like that? Who would want to come back to the sin and the darkness and uh, the evil and the, the crime and the sin and the deception? And Father, I ask you to protect them from evil. Or from the evil one, Jesus says. Though difficulty and persecution awaits the disciples, he prays for their protection. Though difficulty and persecution await him, he still prays, sanctify them in your truth. Set them apart from your, for your service. Even though they're in the world, don't let them be of it. Work in a way that molds them into your holiness. Into what you would have. Like, a sculptor would mold the statue. Mold them. Transform them. In a way that brings them closer to being in your hands. What does that sanctification look like? It's one of those big $3 Christianese words. Well, from our own tradition, the Belgian Confession says it pretty well. It's actually pretty good at explaining a lot of things. Um, if you ever do get the chance to read it. We believe that this true faith, being wrought in man by the hearing of the Word of God and the operation of the Holy Spirit, sanctifies him and makes him a new man, causing him to live a new life and freeing him from the bondage of sin. A new person, new man, new life, and being free from the bondage of sin. That is the new creation that Jesus sends into the world. Yes, into the world. It's a scary place. The world hates us because we don't value what they value, we don't treasure what they treasure, we don't run their rat race. The evil one is out there. Doesn't take long to see it and see how he works. You know, Jesus had some scary conditions in the mission that he had to the world. But once he was resolved to it, once he knew the mission was worth it, the Father glorified him and gave him the name that was above all other names. As that Philippians 2 passage continues to, sit, to go on. You know what happens when we are resolved to live out that mission? Despite all the scary stuff that the world will throw at us? This. It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that he may also so that we may also be glorified with Him. <clears throat> so we can be glorified. I consider that the present sufferings, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the, re for the revealing of the children of God in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Basically, when we live out the mission knowing, even despite the scary stuff, 
our joy gets made complete. In the name of the very one who makes that joy complete. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us true life, true joy that is not fleeting with some feeling or some event that may happen in our lives, but that carries on for eternity. We pray that while we are here in the scary stuff that you have sent us into, that you would keep us close and that we would be ever mindful of abiding in you. Amen.